Hi, everybody. It's Nick. Normally, when we talk about these games, we intend to talk about them for maybe 30, 45 minutes and then do some notes at the end. Today, we talk about Lizard for longer than an hour. So I figured I would get a few of these housekeeping notes out of the way at the beginning of the podcast. First off, I wanted to say that when we started this podcast, I decided I was going to beep out the curse words. There were several reasons for this. One, I wanted to keep the clean tag on iTunes and hopefully open the podcast up to as many listeners as possible. Another reason is while kids may not be seeking out a podcast about new games for 35-year-old consoles, they might be in the room when their parents are listening to one. So the three of us have small kids, and so we wanted to keep the bad language down. So I think this worked for our intro episode. We didn't actually swear that much. Unfortunately, after I censored this episode, I realized that there were so many beeps that it was practically unlistenable. Apparently, once the three of us actually start talking about games, we swear a lot. That is the way that the three of us normally talk. We are profane people. And so I have removed the beeps and I have set the podcast to explicit. I apologize to any of our sensitive listeners, if we have any. I don't know if any of you actually care about this, but if you do, I am sorry. I tried. We did record this episode with the beeps in mind. So there are some sections of the podcast where we were even more profane than we usually are. And so in those cases, I have left the beeps in. Even I have my limits. And some of these comments were just made in extremely poor taste. And so I have left them censored. But most of the dirty words have have been left in. So I am very sorry for that. In other news, we also have a giveaway contest. Matt Hewson, the creator of Witch and Wiz, has given us a free digital copy of that game to give away. Witch and Wiz is an excellent new puzzle game for the NES, so stick around until later in the podcast to hear us talk about that. Finally, in our intro episode, we did not give credit for our opening music, because when we recorded it, we didn't have any opening music. Our opening track is by Twee. You can find them on Twitter at TUI2A03, where you can also find a link to their SoundCloud and hear more excellent music just like this. This is the Homebrew Game Club, a podcast about modern, brand new, aftermarket games for retro consoles. On this podcast, we pick one game a month to play and talk about. Today's game is Lizard for the Nintendo Entertainment System. My name is Nick, also known as Divertov, and joining me today are... Bart Elfrink, also known as Clever Username Needed on Instagram. Uh, Connor Nash, also known as Connor Nash, 1N on Twitter. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that on this podcast, we believe in honest opinions, but we also understand that many of these games are not made by professionals. They are labors of love. Also, as a note to our listeners, we are not game developers ourselves. We are just fans. So please keep that in mind as we offer up any criticisms of these games. I figured I'd read that at the beginning of any podcast. Just as just- yeah, we need, a dis- we need a disclaimer, which is like, please don't like hunt us down and dock us like... I think if you really want it to be accurate, you should read it really fast, like the Micro Machines guy. Warning, your dog's testicles may be cut off if you do not keep the repayments on your mortgage. All right. I think that disclaimer may be relevant tonight. Possibly. So, uh, I think it's going to definitely be important to, to set the tone. <laughs> because uh, uh, this is going to be a different kind of review uh, in that we're going to be I mean, honestly, looking at the game from the eyes of people who are not necessarily in the scene. Well, it's not a review. It's a game club. So we're just we're just playing the game and we're just going to talk about it. So, I mean, you know, your experience with it is your experience. So, Well, like you are the first person who wanted to, um, you know, suggest this game and who had that perspective on this game being a really good one to play. And I'm really glad it's our first game because it does... I think encapsulate a lot of what makes homebrew games really unique. But maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you know made you want to say that this was the first game we should look at for the game club. 
Right. Well, I mean, before we launch into that, let, so let me give some background on the game. Uh, so it is um, is it created entirely by a guy named Brad Smith, and it had a successful Kickstarter in 2014. It raised eighteen thousand dollars Canadian, which at that time was like huge. I, I don't, don't even know what that means. Is that like that's like it's Canadian money? money I don't know. Yeah, it's something. I, it's I don't know how much that right? is. Something maybe I don't know. It was expected to launch in mid 2015, but it was not released until February of 2018. So it actually had a very long development time. And I think I got the sense like it was one of those games that, like, people were pissed that it took that long. Mm-hmm. Which I don't understand. If you're going to back a Kickstarter game, like you, you know, it's like I'm not paying you to give me some shitty game fast. Like if yeah, the game's well, not ready yet, like make the well, game. Software is right? kind of weird because it's like you can't really force it to happen faster. It's not like I don't know. Talk to Hello Games. <laughs> well, oh, they, I mean, sorry. You could you could do that, but like it's it's a different kind of game, I guess. Yeah. I looked uh, it up. Eighteen thousand Canadian yeah, translates to fourteen thousand uh, port park place and boardwalk. Mm. Oh. oh, sorry. No, at this at the time of this recording, fourteen thousand five hundred thirty nine dollars. Okay. Well, I mean, that was a lot for a homebrew back in twenty fourteen. Oh, no, it's a definitely hell yeah. That was but a lot. It's, I think it, there's almost a kind of understanding that the more money you give to a Kickstarter like this, the longer it'll take. Like the scope is only going to increase. Like they're not going to take the money and go, oh, then we're going to make less of a game now. Well, I guess if you're going to like add on a bunch of stuff, but yeah, you know, I've seen uh, plenty of games that they do their Kickstarter after the game's already done, especially for like NES homebrew kind of development. Like the game will already be finished and the Kickstarter is for the materials. Like if yeah. you're going to do yeah. like a cartridge or something. Um, Basically a, a pre-sale kind of thing. Right. Okay. This game is, it, it did have a long development time. It was extensively blogged about through the development. It, he's mm. He released the source code. He's he's created development tools. So like if you're interested in NES homebrew, this game might be a good place to start. Again, I'm not a developer. I don't know, but it looks uh, very interesting. The game is available on on NES. Uh, it's also on Steam. It's on on DOS. He ported it to DOS, and he released it on floppy disks. It's amazing. How many floppy disks? I wonder. Two, three, seven. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I would guess one, just because a NES cartridge is sure. remarkably small. I don't know. So I think it was like a couple. I think it might have been a couple. Mm. Not sure. So as a disclaimer, I would not listen to this if you don't like spoilers. Not, not that there's a lot of story to this game, but the exploration and discovery is a big part of it. That's my take. Now, maybe you guys disagree. You had a different experience with this game. Well, so I mean, I, maybe uh, a, a little bit of spoilers might help people get off the ground. I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think there's not much you can spoil when it comes to some of these games. And it's such a recipe for a cult game in all the things that bring it together. <laughs> Everything about it is very, you know, cult classic like. It has that feeling. Okay, so assuming that at least some of the people listening to this have not played the game, why don't we describe what the game is like? Yeah. So I would call it maybe an action platformer, but with no combat, or it's it's almost no combat. Mm. It's open world. It's sort of Metroidvania ish at first glance, but not really. Yeah, I, I mean, think, could... um, first first thing I realized. After about a half hour of play is that Lizard is the game where everything can kill you except for the stuff that doesn't. <laughs> and it does not tell you what can kill you and what you can't. And it it's crazy. I think um, not having any combat in this game kind of throws people off at first. Because you're just, I, so. I mean, especially on NES, you're used to running around and yeah. shooting things or running around and punching things or hitting things with a sword. And mm-hmm. whereas in this game, you just run around and die. Yeah. yeah, avoid things. A lot. Try not to die. <laughs> you, try, you try not to die, but and you have no life bar. It's it's one hit kills the entire game. Yeah. I I think that the the Metroidvania analogy is 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 also is really true. I I was thinking about Metroid and Castlevania a lot when I was playing the game, but a Metroid and Castlevania where you've no weapons and you have no yes. like ability to control the world around you, like both of those games, you felt like you're getting stronger and stronger every level that progresses. If anything, you just get more and more confused in Lizard. It's just a very surreal experience for a whole bunch of reasons. So I I should say, to start off, the the three of us are going to have very different takes on this. This is one of my favorite NES games. Like, it is one of my favorite 
homebrews it's probably tied for first place with twin dragons i i love that game it's a that is a totally it, that is also a, an action mm. platform I'm looking forward totally to playing twin dragons game. actually in more depth yeah, i've, I've uh, had a chance to play it a little bit but i haven't really gotten into that it. is that is a extremely linear game whereas this one is the opposite of linear uh <laughs> Well, just like, I mean, what were your first impressions when you played the game? I mean, when you plugged it in and turned it on for the first time, what were your first impressions, Nick? Because you, because it is your favorite game. And, and like, you know, what was your feeling when you first approached it? Yeah, the first, I originally played the demo first. And the demo for this game is almost a game in and of itself. That's, that's such a lizard thing to do. That's such a lizard thing. <laughs> I've seen homebrews that were much shorter than than the demo for this game. What was the demo? Did it just have walls in certain places where you couldn't progress past or what? That is literally what it did. Yeah, yeah. It, it it had like a big checkerboard wall and it said this this part is not done yet. Hmm. Yeah. So you could you could explore maybe like four different areas in the game and I think there were two bosses included. But it was a demo that I mean you could just get lost in the demo. It was it was that kind of thing. So there, there are several ways that you can play this game. You can play it on the NES cartridge, which is, I think, the the most difficult way to play this game. There's the the ROM. You can play in an emulator and use save states, or you can play it on Steam. I played it on Steam, and I think that it really colored my experience with the game, because on Steam, you have auto-saving. So... I always felt like I was making progress in the game. If I explored a new area, I could just close the game and walk away and come back and I would be exactly where I was. And I never felt like I had to start over from scratch. Right. Whereas if I played it on original hardware, I'm not sure if I would have felt that way. And we, we can kind of talk about that because I eventually, I do want to talk about the password because I think the the password feature of this game really needs to be talked about. I may have done myself a disservice by only playing it using the password feature and not using save states. Oh, really? Yeah. And I also, I just, I don't know. I kind of wanted to try to play it as, as close to the way it was, I guess, quote unquote, intended to be played if you played it on the Nintendo or the NES. Right. But, you know, I, so I started playing and I did not read the instructions for, and for a person who preaches. I was going to gonna world, ask, I was going to ask if you read the instructions. I did eventually. So for a person, I don't know what it was like when we were sitting at your house and you showed us this game and you were like, it's so good to just go in and not know anything. I took that to mean, don't read the instructions, just explore. And oh, it'll, no. it'll tell you. So I played for a few hours and was just like, Oh, what is this? Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm just like walking in circles. And we got together a couple of weeks ago and you were like, all right, I'm just going to play for a little bit and just check this out. And you like went straight to another lizard. And I was like, holy shit, you can get other lizards. <laughs> and you were like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, what have you been doing? That's and I'm right. like, I, you tell I me, I'm having, I'm having a real trouble with this game. And I'm, I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, just everything kills you. And I said, well, you know, you can, there's one lizard you can get, you can get the heat lizard and that'll, that'll help you. You could actually kill stuff with that. And you were like, there's another lizard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you came oh, over yeah. and you showed me that. So then I started playing again, and I got you know the bounce lizard and the heat lizard and the swim lizard. Like I got a bunch of them, mm. and I you know I did a couple of bosses, and then I just got to this point. I think it was the octopus boss where I just kept getting killed and getting killed and getting killed and getting killed, and finally I was like, screw it, because like you know when you get killed a bunch of times in this game. It brings up this screen that's like, ah, maybe you should uh, try it a different way, go a different path. And then you keep getting right. killed, getting killed, getting killed. Like, oh, maybe this game's a little too hard for you. Probably should try it on easy mode. You know, it's like, seems so condescending when you're like pissed <laughs> off and about to throw the controller. It's like, oh, baby, why don't you try it on easy mode? So I'm like, screw it. I turned it <laughs> off. I put it on easy mode and started playing. And, you know, I got almost just as far within like a half an hour. It was crazy. I was back oh, wow. in that octopus room. But that's that's legitimately as far as I got. I just, that octopus, I must have played that thing 50 times. And I just, I could not beat it. And I've texted you guys, I think it was probably a half hour ago. I was like, that's it. That's as far as I can go with this game. <laughs> You know, totally. as far as the initial like gameplay, not having read the instructions. Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed about it because I always talk about how I read the instructions for every game all the time. <laughs> and this one I decided not to because I don't I don't know why. So I guess we should just come out and say this. This game is damned hard. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is damned hard. And I think that's something that I didn't really appreciate because, again, because I was playing it on Steam and I could just, if I got frustrated, I could just stop and walk away and come back and I'd be exactly at the same place. Also, I think it's worth pointing out I'm a scrub when it comes to playing Nintendo games. Like, I'm just really not that good. And I think you underestimate your own ability, Mr. I complete Gradius finally. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that are just really tough in this game that are there's there's just no quality of gaming like quality of life affordances given to the player if something could be hard it's made hard so yeah i think you know and i'm wondering if that was completely intentional i i don't know like the easy mode so the easy mode was actually just kind of like tacked on at the last minute the easy mode is not in the instruction book it's kind of it's not exactly hidden but you do have to know to press select at the title screen to pull it up. Sure. Which, it, that's like why you get those hints. If you die a, a whole bunch of times, you get a very vague hint that suggests that you might want to press select at the title screen. Hmm? And then if you die a whole bunch more times, it'll just say, hey, if you press select a title screen, you'll get an easy mode. You know, I I wish they would have just put that out there. But I will say, so the easy mode is very weird in this game. In that it all it does is slows the game down. I uh, see. So, I thought that was what it was. I'm playing it. Yeah, I believe yeah. it slows it down to like 40 hertz or something. So it's the same game. None of the bosses are are affected. None of the you know it's not like you you get like a life bar or something. All it does is slows the game down. And the idea behind that is to give you more time to react. Sure. But I don't like the easy mode myself. I I played on it for maybe like an hour just to try it out because I when I originally played the game I was just playing it on normal speed. But yeah, I I do think it's a little bit easier. But I also thought it was like not as fun. It's I, I don't know. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's it's, it's, da- it's downright like like Spart was saying. It's just like oh, just baby want to have a slower game. Like it doesn't yeah. make you feel like I'm having more fun. And it's like the fact that like everything you're saying, like it's tacked on at the end or whatever. It's like somebody said, is it, it just, to is it, do you think it just it feels like it? Well, I like I, somebody, it, to somebody, me, it kind of does. I, I've actually never played easy mode because I, I, I've, like I said, I was kind of going for the save states and I was just using it. Oh, right, right, right. It's a different kind of easy mode. <laughs> it is a different kind of easy mode, but it does sound like somebody just like got the guy before he released the game and was like, dude, this is really fucking hard. Like, this is just not a fun fucking game. Like, you've got to give somebody something to, like, let them play it if they want to play it. Because people who are playing this game, you know, they don't want to just be, like, ground into the dirt and told Yeah, and then when they there. get ground into the dirt to say, oh, sorry, you suck, you might want to try easy mode. Like, right. that just made me so mad when I was already pissed <laughs> off. needless. Like, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. I know, but it, it helped me because you say it was slower. That's what I, I thought. It, it just felt slower, and it helped me with some reaction time, so I was able to make, like, like whenever I was the bounce lizard trying to bounce in between two blue frogs, those fucking blue frogs, <laughs> fucking blue frogs. I, and I, you know, I did the bounce and I was able to like land and then bounce again. And it like totally helped me out. But that was a spot where I must have died 30 times. Yeah. I was oh just, my God. Oh. So, I mean, yeah. my first experience playing it was, it was I actually was sitting in your house, Nick, and, and you showed it to us really briefly. This was like over a year ago. Mm-hmm. This was yeah, it was a while ago. ago. And you were just like, this is a great game. I really love it. It's probably one of my favorite games but it's weird because you have to kind of explore. And I was watching you play it. And I think you gave us the controller and we walked around a little bit and I saw there was like a panda and I was like, okay, this is like kind of strange. And like, I get it. This is like giving you a different kind of vibe. It felt very like the only other game that I think I could kind of like compare it to from that, like first impression was uh, there's this game called another world. Okay. Which actually came out on the PC. Interesting. Uh, like, like way back in like 92, 93, but it was really um, seminal for its time because it used a lot of like motion capture to, to yeah. animate people. That was um, a lot of quick time events too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A quick time mm, event. I love that um, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, that kind of game, and also like similar to that, like Prince of Persia, the original Prince of Persia, because you're, you're dropped in the middle of the action, right? Like Lizard is totally in media res. You're dropped in and like just, literally, you're you literally just told to sky, figure it out. Right. Yeah. And it does make you feel like, okay, I'm here. I gotta figure it out. I gotta like explore. Like you immediately have an instinct to explore. That is yeah. like, very difficult to give somebody as an instruction, let alone to make them feel like they want to do it. So the fact that they accomplished that, b- 
before you've even really started touching the controller is a really great achievement. Like it's great that that's like a, an impetus that you're given. The challenge is then keeping that impetus for the next six hours as you get more and more confused. Well, and I, I think that that, <laughs> I think something that drew me into the game, I think it's interesting that you would compare it to like Another World or Prince of Persia because those are also games where you have to die a lot Yes, that's to a figure very, out what you're doing. That's very true. You know, I mean, like Another World is just a game where you're just constantly getting slaughtered in creative yes. ways until mm -hmm. you finally figure out how not to get killed. I remember seeing, like literally just secondhand watching people play that game and they would just like smash the keyboard. It would just be like so frustrated because the other thing about Another World and Prince of Persia that they do quite well that I actually think Lizard does not do is they make you feel very connected to the main player. To the main character, oh, and yeah. okay. I will say that, like, while Lizard, like, it's great. At, it's you know stimulating that feeling of curiosity. I felt zero connection to whatever this lizard was throughout the game. Well, it's it's literally just a randomly generated avatar, right? Basically, right. but it's like I think that it was obviously a conscious choice by the developer, and I, I'm not going to like question why he did it. But it just it left me feeling really dry and like separate from the action mm, from, from that's this world. Because I never really felt connected to all of that exploration. Yeah, because like even like the skin tone, the hair color, everything is just randomly generated every time you pick up the game. Right. Hmm. Plus, there's also it didn't seem if there was a real objective because I I'm, and maybe maybe it's I haven't read all of the manual. I'll say it again. <laughs> maybe it's in the manual, but it just feels like there's not a real objective. Like when you pick up Mario, it's like save the princess. Sure, sure. You, you know that kind of stuff. Um, but I want to go back to the, the very, very beginning of the game. All right. Like Nick, you said you're literally dropped into the game and you just fall out of the sky and you land. And so you fall out of the sky. I hit the ground and at the beginning of every game, I'm just conditioned to automatically go right. And like, that's where you run into the panda. And so yes. the first time I played, I turned and went back the other way just to see if you could go the other way. And then I ended up, you know, getting super duper lost. It was only after I saw you play and you jumped over the panda and there's a lizard right there, like like three or four screens away. Oh, um, okay, huh? So I was that, wondering that, how you didn't you. Okay, so you thought you weren't supposed to go past the panda yet? Yeah, yeah. You get close to the panda, oh, he like sticks his hand up in the air. It's like ah, or whatever. Okay, you know. You guys have brought up so many points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one thing, I, let's get back to the difficulty because I want to talk about this a little bit. So in this game, I I think it is an interesting combination of a. You know, you have this open world and there is a lack of guidance. You know, as you're saying, there's yeah. like there's there's no guidance at all. And so you you have this open world exploration game, but then you combine it with very difficult platforming, which I think is a really interesting combination that is only going to appeal to a very like narrow segment of people. And, you know, I guess I'm in that segment. But, you know, you, you you're just constantly dying in this game. You know, in a game that is really hard, I feel like the penalty for death needs to be low to keep people coming back and learning what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that, I, that I think is, of a guess. That is not this game. That is this game. Yeah. Does not so a, shit about your yeah, feelings. I mean, like to to use an example of a, a game that I played recently, um, Celeste. So that's sure. a modern indie game, and that's generally regarded as being a very difficult game. It is an extremely difficult platformer and you have no attacks. You know, it's all just about jumping from from platform to platform. Right. And it's yeah. I mean, you just die constantly in that game. I beat the game. I died over a thousand times. Like sure. there's a death counter. I died over a thousand times. But the penalty for death is almost non-existent. So right. when you die in that game, you just immediately go back to the beginning of the screen you were on. Yes. So you can try again. And even when that was in the original Pico 8 version of it. When it was just like yeah. a, a fan game or a little hobby game, that is the same mechanic, and right. it means you just a death is like it, it's 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 clear like you failed, but you're not discouraged. You're just like okay, next time let's do it diff differently. Let's try it this other way. I gotta try this particular combination. Right. Another difference there is that it's it's very difficult, but the thing is, is that despite the difficulty, you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Yes, absolutely. There's a very you know, clear because you're effect. yes in Celeste you are literally climbing a mountain. A mountain. There yeah. is no clearer goal than that. You get to the top of the fucking mountain. Yeah, you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's a metaphor, but it doesn't matter. It's the goal is to get to the top of the mountain. It's very easy to understand. Whereas in this game, you've got this extreme difficulty combined with no guidance at all. 
Yeah. You know, so it's immediately you're I, I like. Think, I think that's worth just calling out, like, because people are like, oh, there's no guidance at all. So it's like, you know, they don't really signpost this. Like, there's no such thing as a signpost. Like, there is, there, there are words that you can read in the game, but they have no bearing on what you're doing. There are landmarks in the game that have nothing to do with what you actually have to do. There are maps in the game with no anchors, or it doesn't even show where you are. Like, the, you show the map, it doesn't even show where you are on the map. It's very abstract in that ability to be like, okay, so like, what am I supposed to do? It is very player driven. Like, the player has to want to go and explore this world. And that's why I'm saying I think it's targeted at like a very narrow demographic of people who really like hard pl- 2D platformers and this kind of totally unguided open world exploration. Be- I would, because I, would I, agree I feel with like that. that is a that is a very unusual combination and I think it's unusual for a reason. Oh yeah. Because not many people are going to be into that. But at the you same know? time that's that is one of the the kind of core group of people who like NES you know, homebrew games, right? People who like really Well, it could be. I, games yeah, I mean as they were. I well, I don't know. I mean, you guys like NES homebrew, do you not? I so mm-hmm. that's yeah, that's a good good point. So one reason that I really like this game so much, you were talking about how surreal it is, how it, you know, it, it literally drops you in from the sky. Another game that does that, I just want to point out, is Super Mario Brothers 2, mm-hmm. which is Actually, another yeah. very, very strange, surreal kind of game. You know, much more, it's a linear game, but it's also very weird and surreal. And it's, I mean, the game is literally a dream. You know, yeah. you're you're like Mario ate a bad pizza and is having a crazy dream. That is the whole. I'm sorry to spoil that game. Who any, anybody? If you haven't played Mario two, that's well, the whole re- fucking. There's game. Good reason why you haven't played Mario two. Let's be honest. It's not exactly up there in the pantheon. But yeah. Oh, eat shit! My yeah, God, that, shit. Is, that is that the worst is fucking, fucking take. Amazing. Worst I'm, fucking you're take. Leave, you're leaving that in. I'm gonna die on that hill. Mario oh my <laughs> God! Fucking, no. At, that's Mario. my favorite NES game of all time. It wasn't That's even a Mario one. game. I love Super oh, Mario. Oh, eat Super. shit. They fucking re-released it. It's Super Mario USA. I have uh, that yeah, fucking super, cartridge. Yeah. yeah Don't sure. tell me it's not a Mario game. Those it's, characters from that are canon. My God. So we're, you're <laughs> off the... I'm cutting your mic. You're, you're out of here. <laughs> I do think that the difficulty discourages exploration, ironically, because the penalty for death can be very high. Yeah. And I think that's particularly true if you are exploring. So when you as you're going through the game, there are these purple rocks that work as checkpoints. So if you if you pass one of these things, the eyes light up and if you die, you will start over at the purple rock. And he was nice enough to put these in front of some of the more difficult platforming sections. So, you know, if you're dying over and over again at say like the trees where the the forest area which yeah. which is my least favorite part of the game because the owls you have to, fucking the jumping around fucking and... owls I, I hate the fucking owls yeah. so yeah like a lot of times i fell out of the trees i would just run up and get killed by something on the ground right, right, and then right, i would right. show up again back back up the last checkpoint that i was at but the thing is the way that the checkpoints are placed it is very easy sometimes to miss them and you can explore in the game for yeah. quite a ways without hitting one And because it's so easy to die, you can just make a jump that is maybe just a pixel too short yeah, or, you know, miss time an enemy just by half a second and die. And the next thing you know, you will be halfway back across the map. And in fact, this happened. We tried to do a live stream of this game on Instagram and it didn't work because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So (laughs) I I totally messed it. Like half the live stream was the camera was in the wrong orientation and then I accidentally deleted the video. Oh, nice. Anyway. uh, Did you delete the ET live stream? No, no, no. That's still up there. Oh, good. Yeah. I you know I'm going to put out a link to that later. But no. So we were trying to record this live stream of this. And Bart, this is where you had told me that you had had a lot of trouble with this game. And so I took over and I was I was going to play the game. I was just going to beat a boss just to show you how to do it. So I, I was going to take on the the boss on top of the mountain. So to get do that one, you need the, it's an ice mountain. You need the heat lizard. So I, I went and I got the heat lizard and then I got lost. and I couldn't remember, even though I've beaten this game twice and I've spent probably like 15 hours just fucking around inside of it. I could not remember how to get back to the fucking mountain. Probably because I was talking to you guys and I was drinking, you know, I was drinking beer and talking and, you know. We were trying to do a live stream and all this other crap. I could not remember where the fuck I was going. And so I kept getting lost 
And I got stuck under the mountain. I got stuck uh, climbing up from the bottom of the whatever. I, I kept finding, you know, ending up in the, the water. I finally, I felt like I was going in the right direction. And so I had a good run going. And I feel like I had finally gotten out of where I was. And I was almost back up to the mountain. And then I made a stupid jump and I died. And I started over again, like way back to where you get the heat lizard. After like five straight minutes of playing without dying, I I just completely reset where I was. And all three of us let out a collective groan. Yeah, because that's like like the opposite end of the map. Yes. And we were all just like, okay, let's let's go play something else. Yeah, let's play something like like E.T. for the Atari 2600. (laughs) (laughs) Which, by the way, you smoked. You just like had that like just locked into your brain. That was amazing. But I, you know, I say that as somebody who who really loves this game. Even I was just like, okay, you know what? Turn it off. We're done. I'd stick. <laughs> Here's the thing. I I love this game as well. I love the idea of it. I yes. love the layout. I love the exploration. I yes. actually do like playing it, but I don't like dying over and over and over. It's like it's it's like one step away from being a great game for me. And I think it all comes down to what you said in the beginning was as, as a platformer, there's no there's no weapons. You know what I mean? It's like if I could just shoot that fucking blue, blue crab. No, so the blue crab, because when you jump crab, over yeah, it, it yeah, jumps yeah, up in the air and yeah. hits you every fucking time. Oh, and it's dude, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So you have to sit there and like wait and like time it right. How about a how about easy mode and it just gives you like a gun? Like That'd a be good fucking too. gun. Yeah. Like, like a contra. Gigantic, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's con- it just turns to, the game into contra. Is there a contra yeah. code for this game? No, oh, we that, can't I say that know, easy contra. mode is contra. <laughs> good lord. Contra has an easy mode though. Yeah, well yeah. What was I mean, I don't think I, I don't think it. I don't think people would like Contra as much today if it did not have the 30 lives code. Oh my god, no. Oh no, absolutely not. I think people would have just forgotten that, about it. But that's like, oh thing. yeah, it's that like, game, I, I kind of remember that game. It was hard as balls. They they made a they made a conscious choice of like what is easy for this game. Right? And so the developer has decided that what makes this game easy is slow, like slowing down the game. So well, yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think he put a lot of time into it. I really don't. You know, I yeah, I, okay, slow. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. But hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, yeah. So I want to. Okay, so we've dumped on this game, the difficulty in this game, for about thirty minutes now. So I, I, I want to talk about some things I like about this fucking game because I really do like okay. it. Okay. Well, here so, you, you have a million things my, you like. Yes. Here, stop, stop. No, you've got a million things you like. You got to give me and Bar have to have the chance to to say what we like because you're going to have like twenty things other than what we like. Okay, well, I'm going to get a beer. Hold on. (laughs) Sure. Okay. (laughs) I can't believe I'm getting him on tilt just from telling him he likes the game. Is he he gone? Can we talk about what we really want to talk about? (laughs) Super Mario 2. (laughs) Hey. I, I I am 100% in agreement with Nick on, on Super Mario 2. I fucking love that game. It's like top three all-time NES games. For me. No. All-time yeah. NES yeah. games? You must be joking. Mm-mm. Well, no. you have to like figure out which turnip you fucking pick up? No. Oh, yeah. I loved it. You throw down that stupid little uh, potion, the potion and then you go in the door into like yeah. the reverse world. And I was like, like always one. so confused. I was like, which? Oh. Where do you throw the potion? What are you supposed to fucking do? Exactly. And I, it was like... Endless like gameplay like, for me, trying to figure uh, out like all the secrets. Like you could, you could throw the potion, then go into the backwards world or whatever the hell it's called, and then like go down the pipe. And oh my god, it was a warp! You know, it's just like, uh, and the fact that you can actually pick shit up out of the ground and throw there is, it. There is absolutely uh, something there where like that like level of exploration was really interesting for you, and I just was not into it. And that yeah. is like that that applies to lizard in some way. I'm not exactly that, sure how that but implies it's, to lizard. There for me too that, that level of exploration that nick is, is just so gung-ho about right uh, it, it just confuses me and I, i'm scared i want to go home yeah. no you i'm know. like but well, it's okay well when he gets back I'll, I'll, I'll the thing that i really like the most about the game but the, the thing that i have probably the most like specific criticism about is the music we're talking like, about mario 2 <laughs> yeah <laughs> when the fucking like you know animal the the dinosaur that shoots eggs you know shoots himself yeah but all that like oh, i know he just music. goes <laughs> that's 
I don't know how they got. I think I think they got that sound by taking a baseball bat and hitting a pigeon, and just like recording it because he's just like. <laughs> it is an awful oh, noise. It's like a bird screaming. Yeah. What are you talking about, Isn't man? You, no, I'm talking about Birdo. I was talking about Super Mario makes. Two while you were gone. Fucking excellent game. No, that's what I'm trying to tell him. Not even gonna go there. <laughs> See, that's the thing about Super Mario 2 is that people who just know a little bit about NES games are like, one of the first things they learn is like, oh, you know, Super Mario Brothers 2 is really just Doki Doki Panic. It's just a rescan. It's a piece of shit. Like, it is fucking not. They changed the goddamn game. They changed it. It's a different fucking game. It's a wrong you know, hack. The, it's a wrong it is, hack. That's you know, what it is. Let me tell you something you know, first. <laughs> If this was, if, Doki, if it was released today, you'd be like, that is a ROM hack, and it doesn't even qualify as a real game. You it is not. Like... Dude, okay, when did you fucking play the original one? It's a... The day like it Nick came is... out for me. Nick is going to come. No, no, no. The, when did microphone. you play Doki Doki Panic? Nobody fucking played it. Nobody oh, fucking no. played it. Nobody, no. what did I tell you? Yeah, you're right. I've never played Doki Doki. <laughs> they re-released it in Japan as Mario USA, and it was very Nick, fucking gonna, popular. You know why it's popular? Because you can buy it. You can buy it fucking today. You, well, you used to be able to buy it for you're gonna get ten fucking dollars. Down. We're doing that. We're doing a. Uh, that's our first Patreon episode. We're going to cover uh, Super Mario Brothers Two. Yeah, Doki yep. Doki Panic. Connor, Connor's the entire episode. Connor's just going to call it Doki Doki Panic. Yeah. <laughs> He's just going to be like uh, every that, time uh, he does. I'm going to call him. <laughs> 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 So that's that's the that's the thirty dollar <laughs> Patreon tier, just in case anybody's wondering. Oh my god! Okay, so the two of you, you wanted to talk about the things that you like because I was going to go off on too many other things I like. Mm-hmm. So that was my theory. Okay, I then the two of you go ahead and uh, tell me what you like about this game. Okay, yeah, so. I like the box art. Go ahead. Yeah, I like no, the music. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, well, you don't like the box art? No, I think no, it's no, really no. good. No, I was kidding in the fact that that would be the only thing that I liked. Oh. Um, you know, I so I went. I actually made a poster of the box art of this game. I got it hanging on my wall right now. Oh, that's really cool. Nice. It is great box art. So, what what did you like, Bart? This this honestly, the stuff that I liked was the nonlinear aspect of it. Because, as you know, my favorite game on the NES is. Uh, Super Mario 2. No, um, it's uh, the, my favorite game on the NES is uh, The Legend of Zelda. And that being a, a nonlinear exploration game just blew my mind when I was a kid. And anytime there's a game like that for NES, I love it. You're saying that. I remember in the intro episode, you were talking about a lot of games that you liked were like Grand Theft Auto 3 and Red Dead Redemption. So a lot of these kind of open world games. Yes. And that's one reason I thought you would that this one would really appeal to you. No, it 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 does. It, it still does appeal to me. I just, I don't. I don't want to say that I don't like the game. Is that I'm just frustrated beyond all belief <laughs> by how hard it is because that's, you that's want all. to explore and you keep hitting walls. Yes, kind of like what it sounds expl- like. Okay, that's exactly what it is. I want to explore and I keep hitting walls, but I love the open world aspect of the game. I love the fact that I thought the lizard just had a beak. No, it's, there's a fucking human in there, and the human climbs out of the lizard skin and <laughs> climbs into another one and then takes off. That's cool. I like the design of the, the world. I love that there are mm. different sections, like there's a whole swimming section and a whole ice section and a whole fire section and that weird laser Tron looking section. I don't remember what they call it. Yeah. But, oh, the um, void zone. Yeah. The void. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah there's, there's a whole lot of stuff to like. As far as, and, and I said the box art, just kind of jokingly, but honestly, that's that's what drew me to the game in the first place. I, I love the box art. There's actually clues to the game in the box art. Oh, shit. I need to look at that a little closer. Than yeah, that. if you look at it carefully, like it tells you how to get to one of the bosses. Well, okay. So, Connor, what what about you? I mean, you've you said there's stuff that you appreciate about the game. Yeah, I mean, I... Any any game like a homebrew game that's like made by one person, you can tell it's like labor of love, and it's like their expression of a lot of the things they want to see in a game. For me, the soundtrack really stands out as being something that has a lot of effort put into it. Oh yeah, I love the music to this game. But at the same time, the soundtrack is exactly it represents so much of the frustrations I feel about the game. So, for example, I went back and I listened to the whole soundtrack, and the soundtrack is awesome. And I listened to every song, and I wanted to kind of 
measure in some way like how much effort I've been put into it. So I just decided to get out the time signature for each song. So the time signature is like how many beats per bar. So a lot of the songs are in uh, standard 4-4 four, four time, which is just like, you know, any pop song. Like one, two, three, four, na 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 like whatever. That's like a standard time signature. But a lot of songs are also in a 6-8 or 3-4 time. 3-4 time being like a waltz. And 6-8 is actually very close to like a, a jig in, in Irish music. So... One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like that's a very common theme throughout a lot of it. And then there are some songs in this game that are just fucking out there. That are just like no clear time signature whatsoever. So for example, like the, the, the Palace. Void. Yeah, so, void, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Void is like more like a kind of a slow air. <laughs> It's literally just, like, it sounds like dripping water. Like, there's no music. It's just kind of, like, atmospheric. This is one of the reasons I feel like it's, like, Metroid. Uh, or, like, you know, oh, Alien. Oh, yeah, music. okay. It's just, like, right. it's very evocative of just, like, you're in a strange place. You don't yes, know where you right. are. The difference between Metroid and Lizard is that Metroid songs are pretty catchy. And Metroid songs kind of drive you forward. Even though it's spooky, you know, as fuck, and you're really, like, scared and you know it's really hard, the music kind of drives it forward for you. You know, there's a, there's a payoff, right? Do, 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 do. Like, that's, that's that feeling when you get something in Metroid and it's like, yeah. I just got a power up or I just got something. There's nothing like that in Lizard. And some of the songs are so complex that you can't hum them. And that's Palace. Yeah, and that's right. why I got into the Palace one where I was like, okay, is this 6-8 or is this 4-4? Four, four? And the time signature changes pretty much every bar. But I was like wow. determined to get it out. But it is a regular time signature and it does repeat. And in fact, when it repeats, it actually adds in extra instruments on its second repeat. So it's not just like I'm noticing a pattern out of nowhere. Like it's no, this is literally the pattern that was programmed in. So the pattern is seven beats for the first bar, then seven beats, then seven beats. So that's three bars of seven beats, then four beats, then four bars of seven beats, then nine beats, then two bars of seven beats, then eight bars of four beats, then six beats, and then it repeats again. catchy like musical tune <laughs> this is like somebody who studied music at a pretty like advanced level and was like let's see if i can make a song that i'm just like changing these time signatures every possible way if, you know that i can and that's kind of one of the things that annoys me about lizard 2 which is that there is such immense talent that's gone into this but you really have to hit your head against the wall and be like okay what the fuck did you do for the time signature here? <laughs> and you have to like write it down. And like I showed you the notes of like me literally counting out beats on a on a notepad. So you were talking about the music not driving you forward, but I think that's kind of lizard. You know, it yeah. doesn't care if you drive forward. That's, it that's just, exactly it. Like it's just here. To... It's like you. It's this is the world. Do what you want to with it. You know, right. if you want to drive forward, if you just want to screw around in this one area, you know, do whatever you want. I think if I had yeah. to sum up Lizard in a sentence, it's like the experience is its own reward. Like you can't yeah, exactly. do anything and, in right. this game and expect that the game is going to basically give you a gold medal and say, well done, you're so good at this game. Like you're either enjoying the game as you're exploring it or that's it. Like you're just not going to get it. 
And either that, yeah, that appeals to you or it doesn't. Yeah. So that's exactly what you, you told me when we first started playing this. You were like, figuring out how to play is part of playing the game. And that's awesome. Here's what I loved so much about playing this game. I, I did not like the game at first. It took me a while to get into it. Like, I had to pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down. And I did that for maybe three or four months before I finally got far enough into it that I was, I kind of got committed at a certain point. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, well, all right, I put a couple hours into this game. Now I feel like I need to see it through. And I, I found the platforming challenging. But again, because I was playing it on Steam, you know, I could close my laptop screen and, and, and walk away. Right. And then come back and just pick up exactly where I left off. You know, whereas if I were playing on original hardware, I, I really would have to start over from scratch. But yeah, so, you know, I, I've talked to you guys about how I used to play all these games that we had sitting around the rental store. There are so many bizarre NES games, weird stuff, stuff that you it, like. It doesn't make sense. It only makes sense in the context of an 8-bit NES game. Yes. A lot of those games, when you would go to the rental store, you'd pick them up and they didn't have manuals with them. So you just kind of had to figure it out as you were going along. And I remember having this experience so many times with games like this, where you're in a new world and clearly this world has its own physics, its own language, its own mechanics. There's something going on here. And it's this this idea of having to learn to communicate with a game in its own language. In the meantime, you're you're just trying to figure out what the hell is this thing trying to say to me? What am I what am I doing here? I have no fucking idea. That feeling of like disorientation, but also like combined with a kind of like curiosity, I you know, it like that is an experience that was that was so NES to me. And it it died out when when Super Nintendo came along because in, with Super Nintendo games, you could put so much more information in them. You know, and this like a Super Nintendo game can tell you how to play it. Pilot Wings can tell you how to play with every little mechanic that it has, or, or Super Mario World can literally tell you what to do every time that you get a new power up. You'll get a text box that tells you what to do with it. Right. NES games never did that. NES games, you just had to figure them out. And I had that feeling when I was playing this game of just being completely baffled by it and just so confused until I got, I felt like I got it. I got sucked into it. And it was like, Almost like a spell came over me and I was caught up in the world and I just really got into it. And I just the idea that I was, you know, because it's designed by one person. Right. M many NES homebrew games that just have one developer don't have this level of depth to them. But to me, it was like I was getting lost inside of this this person's head. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, you guys didn't beat the game, but that actually does tie into there is kind of an ultimate theme to the game. And that is not far off. That feeling to me, as I got sucked into the game, I just got hit with this like feeling of nostalgia for just NES games in general. And it reminded me what I loved about the console. And I, ha I have not had it, that experience ever with any other console. And I haven't really had that experience since. I don't know, since I was playing these games back in the 80s and 90s. And that was one of the reasons why this game is so special to me is because it was able to evoke that sense of nostalgia in a way that none of these other homebrew games, they've gotten close, but they've never just hit it on the head like this one did. Yeah, I like in particular the way you mention how it just leaves you really baffled and how it leaves you really confused, but it's, it's still a cohesive, well-made game. And that that kind of like dancing between like, because if you're making a very well put together game, it, as a developer, it's actually very tempting to want to explain things to your player. Right? You you want to give the player very often a lot of that information because you want to say, look, appreciate all of this. Look at all the things that are here that you can do and all the things that I've, I've built for you. But Lizard is not like that at all. Lizard is like, it's like a world you're stepping into that really does not care about you per se it's more just like like you're dropped in and you're the lizard and whatever but like you're having to learn all of these rules all of these physics all of the ways that the game works for yourself right, right. and it never really makes you feel like you're a part of it 
you've never you never feel like yeah that's it i'm now like i I've, i own this game like, I, I just know exactly everything about it you can progress very far enough but you'll always feel like kind of an alien in this world right and we talked about this in the live stream and i wish i had it but we had a really ex- <laughs> interesting conversation about this game as so you're you're in this like strange incomprehensible world you're you're confused and disoriented Everything is hostile to you. There's danger around every corner and you're, you feel completely helpless. You have no idea what you're doing or why. It's, this game is an existential crisis simulator. Right. <laughs> is it not? It's like, <laughs> I think it's after, like, after a little while, yeah, it becomes, it becomes yeah, that. That's, a, that's exactly what it, can you imagine like Jean-Paul Sartre playing this game? He did, you know, the, uh, he'd like fall off some platform for like the 15th time and he'd just be like, merde. <laughs> It's the most existential NES game. That's its claim to fame. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> I mean, even like even even the the music is pretty like existential. Like you're just kind of like seriously. Some of it's like I love the music. music. So I yeah, the music is so evocative of every environment, and to me, like every track. It has such a clear sense of place. Like you are so obviously in a different part of the map now, and it's got its own character. It's it's might have its own enemies. It's. I was I, playing, and my wife came into the room to tell me something, and she like stopped stopped there for a minute and watched me play. And she's like, "This music sounds so familiar. This is really good." And like she commented, that's the one thing she commented on was the music. And then right before we got on here, I just kind of jumped back in for a minute to just run around. And my daughter came downstairs and she's like, what are you playing? And I was like, oh, it's this game called Lizard where you're a lizard. You run around and then you die. And then you die. And then you die. And, then you die. <laughs> and she's like, die. what? And I was like, watch. And I died. And then I died. And then I died. And she's like, oh, I like the music, though. <laughs> and then she took off. So, like, yeah, there's definitely something to this music thing. It's freaking amazing. I also really like the graphics. There's so much polish to this game. You know, all the little details, True. like the 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 little white birds that flit off when you when you walk through the the palace area or yes. not the pal- the the ruins. You yeah. know the, the do, 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 You know, and the, you they just fly away. I definitely agree with that. But so this is one of those weird things where I feel like so many of the sprites in the game have a lot of character. Everything else, I totally agree. Like the whole world, like there's all these weird. There's like the wizard fucking enemy who can like, uh, right, warp right. around. That's fucking amazing. Like really, really cool character. Like the 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 tiles for the actual like environments are great. Mm-hmm. The lizard itself, I was like, is is, is that it? Like, this, well, this, it's meant to be an avatar though. Like for your your exploration. Yeah. The real know? character, Connor, is what's inside of the wizard. <laughs> And that's true, though. No, I, I think I think you're right. No, I, to me, I just, it's like what what do you bring to the game? What do you no, what I, are you bringing to the game? I can see you know, that for sure, and I'm not saying that that's a, a bad choice. It's just a very deliberate choice that made me feel less connected to that character. Speaking of those wizards, man, I thought they were a little too close to the wiz robes in the Legend of Zelda. I kept expecting them to like fly across the screen like the the, the wizards <laughs> on level six of Legend of Zelda. Listen, did. man, I think those wizards are fucking hard enough. They are. Okay? I, yeah, yeah with a little spinny donut thing that spins yeah. around. I, yeah, that is hard enough. I don't need yeah. them to be any harder than that. The hardest thing that I ran across that killed me the most times was that I don't know what it is, but it looks like a little skinned cat <laughs> that just like it runs and then it sits and then it runs after you, and then it sits. Oh yeah, oh, I right, died right, right, on that right, right. thing yep. so many times. Yeah, because it moves yeah. so fast when it chases. it's amazing. Yeah. You know, this game has so many things that can get you. It's like little things like that can make you feel so bad at video games. Yeah, and then when I ran across the the pig that takes your coins, I was like, ah, this thing's gonna kill me somehow. <laughs> and then I got close enough, and it oh, you found me. the pig. Yeah. So like, I actually yeah, never found was, the pig. No. That's how you save your coins. Okay, so there are a couple things that I want to mention about this game. The coins do something. They are not saved by the password. The password does not save. It saves your lizard, and it saves the last checkpoint you were at. It does not save the number of bosses that you have defeated in the game, and it does not save the number of coins that you have collected. That was a deliberate choice, from what I can tell from comments that I've read that he has made online and interviews that, that that Brad Smith has done, that was a very deliberate choice. And he meant for that to be a surprise. 
this is one of my main criticisms of the game. I don't think that's a nice surprise. <laughs> I think it's a no, really it's like automatically place. turning on fall damage. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it's like nine out of 10 people are going to, you know, you're going to get like, you collect like 30, 40 coins, right? Out of 125 in the game or whatever. You get your password, you save, you know, you you think you've saved, you got your password, you walk away, away from the game, you come back, you enter your password, and there's all the goddamn coins again. You have, you have made no progress through the fucking game. I, do, I have to think that at some point, the, the, the guy who made the game, every so often he's just like lying in bed, you know, he's thinking of all the things that are going on in life. He's like, some sucker out there thought he just saved all his coins. <laughs> oh my God. Here's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like you guys both really like everything about this game except playing it. Uh, that sounds like a shitty criticism, but I think you're right, and it's yeah. not a criticism. No, like I, I, I do like the game. I do, and just and I, I like actually watching I would somebody go, play it. Yeah, I would go even further and say that you could definitely extend that criticism or like whatever you want to say that is like to other games that I play that are not homebrew games. Like there's games that are modern games that i just like i'd love to be able to spend the time to like level up my character to level fucking 60 or to mm -hmm. like get all the loot and to like be really good at the meta game in it like i mean well, there's so many games that have that kind so of like, you guys sound like it might be frustrating because you don't have the time that it would that, take that could yeah. be it me as a 14 year old yeah would have loved the game mm -hmm. but that's not a criticism of the developer like the developer has every right to he make made a, game a great game wants. yeah exactly and i think it's it is a great game it's just a game that is difficult to appreciate for the reasons we've outlined so yeah it's like i was saying about the password okay because like nine times out of ten nine people out of every ten people are gonna they're gonna run into that password and they're gonna get that nasty surprise and they're gonna say like fuck this game i'm never coming back to this what an asshole fucking game fuck this you know i'm piece of trash whatever but like that tenth guy is going to be like, interesting decision. All right, that's the way this game works. Mm -hmm. Curious, you know. And then they're going to jump back in and go like, okay, now I know that the password does that. Awesome. But wouldn't you, just devil's advocate here, wouldn't you want to make a game where nine out of ten people go, ooh, interesting. I'm going to play that game. Would you? Would you? I don't know. I don't know it's either. A, it's a the guy made a game for the NES. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I get that. That's Maybe that he is... doesn't give a shit. I don't know. It, that, to me, is one of the things that is so interesting about this game. It is just such a... It is its own experience, and it doesn't care if you like it. It is made for, like, a tiny handful of people, and those people that find it are like, my God, this is my game. Uh -huh. You made a game for me. I just think it's curious to play a game that doesn't seem to care if you like it. Like, when's the last time you had that experience? And maybe that's what I mean when I say it filled me with this nostalgic feeling because I, it, you know, I, I haven't really seen a game do that since the NES where you could have a game that was just so fucking weird, you know, a game that, that just forced you to experience it on its own terms. I think the the other thing I think I have to touch on just briefly, because this reminds me of it, is just these are games that are made for the NES. And the NES is really hard to develop for. And there's a programming developer conference that's in St. Louis every year. It's called Strange Loop. And there was a guy who spoke at it this year, and he basically did a talk on the book I Am Error, which is the story of the NES technicals and, and like how that it works oh i oh nathan altice yeah so he it was wasn't he the guy doing the talk no it was oh it wasn't guy. him okay oh, oh, the guy oh who owns okay. the domain famicom.party he goes into details like how they just got every little bit out of the nes like when they just had no space to even store the game like the first level of mario one is stored in 101 bytes like literally the space that it takes to write 101 letters describes the entirety of the Mario 1 level 1-1. One, one. So that's wild. But then you understand then that like that's the kind of constraints that you're dealing with. And when you're able to make such a vibrant and unique world with such a tight limit around literally the, the number of letters you can use, there's something really just remarkable about that. 
that is, you know, it's kind of a flex, but it also is like, I think it must just focus you as a developer because you can't add in like crazy 3D graphics and you can't add in analytics to determine what people are doing and you can't add in like all this other stuff. You really just focus in on what the game is going to be. And Lizard really does have a purity of vision that I, I don't know if you could actually achieve it in, like to your point earlier, Nick, about like on a SNES, right? And a Super Nintendo. There would just be too many opportunities to be like, oh, well, I'll put in a little sign here that says what the person's going to do. Because it's so limiting, it almost just like, it focuses the entire game to be around the world, not anything else. It's like you're getting this portal into a world that like, that's all that you're going to be able to do. You don't have the ability to have any, I guess I would say like, things that the player likes. It's all about what that world is about. And, And you go in and you explore this world and you either like the world or you don't. Okay, so here's a question. Would you guys recommend someone play this game? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Like, without hesitation. You're without both hesitation, like, yes, I yes, would. Yes, play this fucking game. Yep. Connor, you agree with that? Yep. Yeah. Plus one. Plus one. Wow. Lizard, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I want to beat it now. That's, you know, and I, uh, that's right, probably you're gonna come back. You're going to beat this. We're going to have to cover this game again. Nick, oh my thing. god! On, I know you got at least one more thing in the tank. Come on, tell me just whatever is like top of your mind. You want to say? Who me? Yeah, I do have a thing. Are yeah. we done talking about this game? Because I ha- I have one final story I wanted to say about this game. Okay, one Let's final. Do it. Thing. Give it. Okay, so here's Hardcore Gaming 101. is one of my favorite video game websites on the internet. They do deep dives on on games. They'll trace a game from like its origins and like cocktail bars and like 1978 all the way up through like mobile games and. But it's it's written in an almost academic way. It's a fantastic website. I would advise anybody to check it out. They have a podcast that is very smart, but it's it's very silly. It's very different from the website. The shtick behind the web the uh, podcast is that everybody likes lists, so they're going to rank every game on a single list, like every game ever made. So it's called like the top forty seven thousand games of all time. Every week they pick a different game and they put it on this massive list. It's a really entertaining podcast to listen to because they go over some really obscure games. But they have a a thing where if you leave them a five-star review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever they're calling it, you can nominate a game for them to cover. So this was my favorite podcast. I listened to every damned episode, and I was like, I am going to nominate the best fucking game for this podcast. And I could not decide what I wanted to nominate. I, it took me a year. I listened to this podcast for a year before I left a five-star review because I could not decide what game I wanted to nominate. And so eventually I decided, you know what? I, I got, I got into this homebrew scene. I'm going to nominate micro mages. I want people to see that there's really good homebrew games out there. There's, there's brand new games being made for consoles like the NES and they need attention. People need to know about this. And I don't know what the audience for this podcast is. It, it might be tiny. I, I have no idea. At the very last minute, I go to write the review and I actually changed it at a, as I was writing the review because as much as I love Micromages, this is the game I wanted to hear people talk about. I played this game and I could not stop thinking about it. And I wanted to talk about this game with somebody. So I nominated Lizard. And I was really excited about this. So I waited about six months. The episode finally comes out. And you can pull it up today on their podcast stream. And they absolutely hated it. (laughs) Shit. It was actually the worst episode of that podcast I have ever heard. Because it was so short. It was like 10 minutes long. And basically everybody in the podcast was like, this game sucks. Are we in agreement here? Oh, yeah, this game sucks. So they like stick it on the list way down, like in the bottom 20% of the list. It's like it's one notch above eight eyes, which if you understand, if you know eight eyes, that's not a compliment. I was devastated. And it actually, I swear to God, made me wonder about my my own fucking opinions on video games. You know, because I thought like, you know, I've been playing video games for 30 fucking years. I was like, you know, I'm. 
kind of know what I'm talking about. Like, no, it's like after this, I'm like, maybe I don't know anything. Maybe well, my maybe, opinions uh, are absolute garbage. Well, maybe you on know, the podcast today, we will talk about it for longer than 10 minutes. Who knows? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm like listening to this. And I'm I'm thinking about it, and I'm because th- I can't stop thinking about it. I'm like motherfucker. So then I, you know what? I had this like you know the principal Skinner meme. Oh yeah, no, it's I think the, it's the kids that are. It's out the of touch. kids that are out of touch. Yes, it's the podcasters that are wrong. I I am not out of touch. I am not mistaken about this game. It's the fucking podcasters that are wrong. I'm going to make my own goddamn podcast. And and this is why we're here today. That's why we're here today. Hey, I want to be part of that podcast because I played Lizard, and honest to God, my I think my final opinion of that game is that if I had more time to play it slowly and at my leisure, it, it could. I mean, honestly, it could very well be my favorite homebrew game. It, so it if could, we if we didn't spend a month on it, if we spent like two years, two years on, okay. Uh, I know and that sounds a like ringing endorsement for this game. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It kind of is because I feel. I feel rushed in in like pushing through it as fast as I could to try to get as much of it as I could. And that's probably why I got so frustrated. You know, if I could have taken this in, in 30 minute doses, you know, once a week for two years, uh, I might. But be... can you ask that of people in no, today, I don't, today's I don't age? I don't know could. that you can. I don't think that you can, you know, Mm-mm. so I don't know. Maybe. You know, so I, you know, I started a podcast to talk about this game, literally just this game. And I'm the only one here who's like really in love with it. So you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. That's all. I, I don't think you're wrong. I think you've just been with it for a longer time than we have. I don't know. I don't know. It's a closer friend of yours than it is of us. Yeah. I'm going to go make a podcast with this game. Fuck you guys. It's yes. just going to be me and this game cartridge. And we're just going to be talking about homebrews. <laughs> Hey, what do you think, Lizard Cartridge? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fascinating. It's just like that uh, that movie with Tom Hanks, you know? <laughs> Turner and Hooch. We're talking about beach ball. Yeah, Turner and uh, Hooch, right? Volleyball, volleyball. Yep. What do you think about that new Contra game for the mobile system, Lizard Cartridge? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting opinion. I hope other people agree with it. Okay, so we have been talking about this game for a long time. We are going to take a short break here, listen to some music, come back. We have listener email. I cannot believe it. We have listener email. We have some homebrew news we're going to talk about, and then we're going to kick it to our next pick for the game club, reveal our next episode. So please stick around for that. Please enjoy. This is the river theme to Lizard, one of my favorite tracks from that soundtrack. Thanks everybody for sticking around. We are back. <laughs> we are back. Unfortunately, Connor Nash is no longer with us on this episode, but we have a guest host filling in for him, a Super Mario Brothers 2 cartridge. Yay! What? Hello, hey, Super what? Mario Brothers yeah. 2 cartridge. Oh, yeah. yeah that, well, that's great. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Oh, about Connor? Really? Do you, you want to talk about Whoa, whoa, that's a hot take there, Super Mario Brothers 2 cartridge. I mean, those are pretty serious accusations. You know, if you're going to say something like that about Connor, you should be able to back it. You have proof. 
with animals? Okay, look, maybe that's legal in Ireland. I don't know, but I know you can't do that here. Okay, this is a family show. I'm I'm gonna have to take you off the podcast. You're done. I'm cutting your mic. Well, you know what? F- yourself in the God. God. Bye bye, Super Mario Brothers two cartridge. What a jerk. You know what? Maybe Connor had a point. Maybe that is a bad game. No, no, no. I still agree that it's a uh, it's a good game. We just got a bad copy. It's a good game with a bad attitude. There That's you go. That is. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, that was a fun bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so we've got some Lister emails. Do you think people are going to go, wait a minute, this is the first fucking episode. How is their listener mail? I mean, that's what I'm doing right now. Right. Uh, Thank you so much. Anybody listening to this, that's amazing. So our first email comes from Jordan Davis from Space Raft, uh, the band Space Raft, as well as the developer of the game Space Raft. Uh, Jordan writes in, that game has masterful soundtrack for the NES sound chip. Talking about Lizard again. I made a mixtape of Lizard for my van. Best music for driving around is the surf theme, which we just listened to. Check out Brad's tune on the Bit Puritans 2A03 Puritans compilation album. You know, I'm really glad that he said that because I had totally forgotten about that. So that is 2A03 Puritans. That's Bit Puritans. That used to be available. You could actually get the cartridge on Infinite NES Lives. I don't know if that's still on there or not, but you can. I, I will put a link to the Bandcamp for this album in the show notes. That is a really good chiptune album. And the Brad Smith tune on that is very similar to a lot of the tracks in Lizard. So it's it's got a very similar kind of vibe. And there's a lot of really good ones on there. That's a, a great album. So I'm glad that he wrote in. And Jordan writes, Brad is a really incredible musician. His ne- music never stops inspiring. So thank you. You can find Jordan at uh, Raftronaut, Raftronaut on Twitter. That's awesome. Thank you for, so thanks for the email there, Jordan. We also have an email from Deadeye Bit. He writes, hey, Brew Club, Lizard, loved it. I put off playing through it for a while, waiting to be in the right mood for this mysterious and large adventure. I wish I'd gotten around to it earlier because in the end, I now have it on my top homebrew list. The world is just so well built and draws you in. Favorite lizard suit? Coffee lizard, followed by the lizard of bounce. I just like toggling on the white boots, but drinking coffee and getting super high jump beat that out. The one thing I wish I figured out earlier was that the passwords were meant as warp points. Hey, warp points. Interesting. I, all right. I had no idea. Which Brad let me know during an interview for Homebrews and Focus. I will need to replay Lizard soon to make use of that. Deadeye. Thank you, Deadeye. So yeah, Deadeye has his own podcast. It's called Homebrews and Focus, and it they are deep dives. Deep so I think his interview for Lizard was like five hours and he like plays through the game with Brad Smith. I actually did not watch it before this because I was worried that after five hours, like I would not remember my own takes on this. But makes sense. I did jump in for like bits and pieces of it and it it is very informative. So he's done several of these episodes now and they're all really deep dives like that. But I'm glad he said that. Dude, we didn't even talk about any of the secret stuff for this game. No, we didn't. I thought we were going at it as a non-spoilery kind of thing. I don't know. Well, you guys, there's a lot of secret stuff. There's a ton of secret stuff. That's part of what is like makes the game interesting to me. It it is a puzzle. The whole game is a puzzle, and I feel like I'm constantly, I'm constantly like pushing at the boundaries of what the game is apparently letting you do. And you know, sometimes you can go past those boundaries and and find some really interesting stuff. I like as an example. When I was playing through this game for this podcast, I decided to do a playthrough using the Lizard of Knowledge as much as possible. Like, I had never tried that before. Like, because the, the game's got kind of like a Mega Man rhythm to it. Like, you know, there's there's certain bosses that work. The Stone Lizard works best with the, the Fire Raccoon boss, the Volcano mm-hmm. boss. The Heat Lizard works best with the Ice Rabbit boss. So there, there's a preferred lizard to beat every boss. And it's not your Lizard of Knowledge. The Lizard of Knowledge is like the pea shooter in Mega Man. You know, you mm-hmm. don't want to go into a boss fight with that. But if you do use the Lizard of Knowledge, the bosses have dialogue. No. Oh. Like they will talk to you. The Lizard can talk to them. And I did not know that until I did this playthrough. I have been playing this game for almost three years, and I just now discovered that. Like that is Lizard. That's the experience. You know, it's just, it's just like you're just constantly finding new stuff. 
And I know, so you didn't, you didn't get far enough into the game to, to find any secrets. I know Connor found the lounge lizard, which is like a, it's kind of a joke lizard. And there are another couple. And I don't know that there's at least one. I, well, there's two, I don't think I want to talk about, but the coffee lizard, uh, dead. I mentioned that in his email. So yeah, that was another one where I had gotten the coffee lizard before. And I didn't even realize that the coffee lizard had a secret power. When you press the B button, he walks around with a giant coffee cup and takes drinks of it. And it's super cute. And I thought the whole point of this lizard was just to be cute. You know, but it will actually, if you drink the coffee, you jump higher after you drink coffee. I, I don't know how high it is. It's like between like maybe like 30 and 50 percent higher. It's nice. it's yeah, it's a significant boost. And it actually makes the game easier. So I yeah, after I get the coffee lizard, I'm just going through the entire game, like holding a coffee mug. Like, so I can get my bonus. Yeah, that's the, right. the crazy thing about the game. You said it was like a puzzle. And to me, it feels like a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Which <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a while to get through it. At this point in my life, I am uh, more of the like, each individual level is a puzzle type games. Like something right. like Alfonso's Ar- Arctic Adventure, which we may or may not do later. But like that is more my speed, at least at this point. I don't. You know, trying to sit down and like really get into Lizard, you got to play it for a couple of hours. And I just don't have a couple or hours. months, months. Or, well, I mean, like a couple hours straight, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, just to really get anywhere, to really feel like you're making any progress. And it's, you know, I'm, that's probably why I didn't get as far as I did is because I was taking it in like little bite sized pieces. And I just kept felt like I was repeating right. myself and repeating myself. Um, and with the, the revelation that came out of that email that the, the uh, passwords are just more like warp portals yeah you know okay. that's pretty cool but it's, it's not- cool but i don't understand how it's supposed to work like I, I i i have never understood the passwords and like thinking about that like how they work as warp warp zones i still don't i don't know i i, I was because i've been i've been messing around with the game trying to figure that out and i still don't understand quite how it's supposed to work Honestly, dude, more research is needed. I think I'm I'm going to keep playing the game, and I'm sure you'll probably keep playing the game. And maybe, who knows, maybe we'll come back to this in a year. <laughs> yeah, we should check in like every six months you or know. so and just see where you are with Lizard. Yeah. Bart's Lizard so. Journey. That's going to be our spinoff podcast. Sounds great. I'm in. <laughs> All right. Are we, are we done talking about Lizard? Yes. Yes. We're done talking about Lizard. For now, Con- Connor. Are, oh, Connor's not. Ask here. the Super Mario uh, Brothers two cartridge. I'm going to take the. Yeah, I will take it off. I will take it off mute here briefly. Uh, hey, Super Mario Brothers two cart. Are you? Uh, you you have anything to say about Liz? Okay, you're you're done. You're done. All right. Yeah, that was uh, that was disgusting. That was horrendous. Just disgusting. Just a really bad attitude on that game. It's a very fun game. It is fun. It's just nasty. So I hear we got some uh, feedback from that intro episode. Is that correct? Yes, we did. So yeah, uh, Connor made a comment about, well, Connor and I were talking about the Nintendo 64 homebrew community. And I said, I don't think there's ever really going to be much of a Nintendo 64 homebrew community. Just because of the way that the architecture works for the, the system. So we did get a comment on Discord, which is... Not going too bad, considering we just launched it. We've got uh, maybe 10 participants over there, which is, hey, it's booming for a brand new Discord. Yes, if you're not a part of our Discord, please join. Hell, I even joined. Yeah, we even got Bart to join. I did not think that was ever going to happen. But yeah, we have a comment. Uh, it was from Alistair Lowe from Low Tech Games. So he was the developer of Flea and Tapeworm Disco Puzzle, uh, Flea Jump on mobile. My son really likes that one. But yeah, he wanted to chime in to say there actually was a game jam I think it was last year that had some really interesting games. Most of them are still kind of in that demo stage, but they do look super cool. So yeah, I, we stand corrected. I will put a link to that in the show notes. There's a YouTube video of, of some of the clips of that. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. The next thing we were going to talk about uh, was some, maybe some new homebrew games. Uh, There's a new homebrew game out called Witch. Uh, Witch and Wiz, and Nick has been talking about this to me and Connor for a couple of weeks because he's participated. I will not in, shut up about it. I know he's participated in the closed beta, and like he he would text us two three times a day about how awesome the game was. It's apparently a new puzzle game for the NES, and yeah. it is now available through purchase through Limited Run Games. What is it up through December twelfth? Is that right? December twelfth. Yes. Sweet. And the digital is for sale on itch.io and 
If you buy the limited run games physical edition, it also includes the digital. Yeah, and that's like it's got the soundtrack in there and wallpapers and stuff like that. That's so. amazing. And also, ten minutes before we recorded this, <laughs> do you want to tell them about this, Nick? This is amazing. Yeah, it was a bit because we were like setting up the mics, and I got a message on Discord from Matt Housen, who who is the uh, the developer of Witch and Wiz, and he was he asked us if we wanted to download code to do a giveaway. So amazing, thank you. We do. So what we're gonna do, the guys and I touch base on this briefly before recording. Leave us a review on on iTunes. It can be any review we would prefer a five-star review leave us a review and we will put your name into a random drawing and when we record our next episode we will give away the digital copy of witch and wiz i do want to talk about this game because it is really fantastic i don't know if i would wait for the next episode to jump on the physical copy of this game because it is outstanding it is a little like a Sokoban type game. It's like block pushing, but it's it's a platformer also, so you have gravity to deal with. It does a really good job of switching up mechanics so that you never get tired of the game. So I felt like it's got a really nice learning curve. Every dozen or so stages have their own learning curve, and then you get introduced to a new mechanic, and then the next several puzzles use that mechanic. So if you like puzzle games, it this is the kind of puzzle game where you will play until you get stuck on a really tough one. And then you'll come back in a day or two and look at it in a new way and immediately be able to solve it. You know, it's one of those things that it'll just kind of stick in your brain. It's a good challenge. Well, I can't wait to get my hands on it and try it out. It sounds fun. Yeah, it's an excellent game. It's a lot of fun. I, I, We might want to cover it for the game club. If not, you guys just really should play it because it's fantastic. I would put it, I mean, I would put it among the, the top tier of like NES Homebrew. I really do think that it's that good. So Sweet. Next time you and I get together and we play a couple of new games, you should we should check that one out. You totally should. Yeah. And I did play, so I was a, a, a beta tester on this, but it was very late stage beta. Like I played, the copy that I played was basically the, the it was the final ROM. So... But yeah, I'm I'm amazed that they've got a limited run release. That's fantastic. I did not expect that. But um, yeah, limited run is really pushing towards new NES games, which is great. I like to see that. Yeah, I always love to get new NES games. So yeah, I follow you on Twitter. I follow you on Instagram. I've seen you post about this, and you text me two or three times a day, and you've texted me a few times about this, the Retro USB Xmas 2021 cart. Tell me about that. I, I love the past ones that we've that we've messed around with. Let's let's hear about this 2021 version. Yeah, so these carts are pretty well known about among NES homebrew collectors. They come out with a new one every year. These carts have like some kind of Christmas themed. They tend to be party games. So like the one that they have this year is it's like Excite Bike. It's called Excite Ducks. So you are a duck on a snowmobile or a snow machine, I guess, for people from further north. But yeah, it's four player. It's a randomly generated track. You don't need four players to play it. You can use AI. I So I did play a little bit of this yesterday. I, I did a few races all by myself. It is like pure chaos. Awesome. It's going to be a really fun party game. Is there a way to get my hands on that or at least check out a ROM or something like that? So it's on Retro USB. They have a section for homebrews and all of the ROMs are free. They've all been released in the past for free. So you can actually try the ROM. But when the the cool thing about the carts is that they're almost like Christmas decorations in and of themselves. They're covered in blinky lights, and the lights actually flash in time to the music. It's so, really cool. Check it out. It's on Twitter, Instagram, and Discord. You got You got to look at. I yeah, I put video of this up. I stuck it into my analog NT Mini, and like, which is a top loader, which I think is the way to play this, and it absolutely looks ridiculous. I love it. It is. It is like it is like. This is the video game equivalent of the tacky Christmas sweater you get out for holiday parties every year. You know, you wear it like once, once a year, and it's it's completely ridiculous and everybody loves it. And then you kind of put it back. People love the tacky Christmas sweater, but you do play it at Christmas and then you put it away and then you bring it out the next Christmas. And say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's amazing. But the games are not that deep. You know, they're they're sure. demos. They're meant to be demos, but they're like fun party games. So you can play through one go to the next one. And I, I think they're perfect for that. The one that he came out with last year was, it was based on Dr. Mario. So it was Dr. Covio. So COVID. Nice. Oh, and yeah, it was, it's actually like a four player Dr. Mario. Wow. 
Yeah, if you can imagine that. I I I think that we need to get together and play this. I've I've wanted to play this with four players because it 100%. seems insane. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, I, they're they're fun games. I check them out. I did want to mention since we're talking about new homebrew news. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how much news we're going to be able to talk about on these podcasts, but I I just want to share stuff that I've I've seen come across our Twitter feed or whatever. Sure. So the there was a Game Boy development competition that just wrapped up maybe a month ago. There were 149 submissions oh. to this Game Boy development competition. The Twitter account GBDev, GBDEV0, they've actually, uh, it, as we're recording, they're working on like their final rankings of some of these. They made like, they made like a short list. Yeah, the best of that, 149. And I, I guess by the time we're live, that may be live. I'm not sure. But I'm really interested to see what they come out with there because there's some really amazing Game Boy development. I had not expected there was like so much Game Boy development going on. That is totally brand new. But That's awesome. Yeah. When it does go live, we'll just we'll put the link to it in the show notes. Yeah, 149 entries. <sighs> that is bananas. Boy. Speaking of Game Boy homebrew. I think it's about time. Yeah, we're going to announce our next game. Sweet. So the next game for the Homebrew Game Club is going to be Dead AS. So this game had a recent physical re-release. I I don't know. By the time that this is live, I don't think you're going to be able to buy a physical copy. So I apologize about that. But I did kind of hint on our Twitter and and, uh, Discord that this was going to be the next game. So if you really wanted this game, I hope you already picked it up. However... The good news is this game is name your price on itch.io. You can go on there, uh, give them whatever amount of money you want to give them to play this game. It is super interesting. It is a horror game. It is sort of a Pokemon looking RPG styled adventure game. It is definitely not Pokemon. Definitely not. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) It's definitely not Pokemon. It is not a difficult game. It is pretty no. easy. I would, there's no combat. It's also there, right up my alley because it was kind of short. And I really liked it. It was very that. short. Yeah. yeah. So like it's, I think the first time through it took me less than an hour to beat. So there are 11 endings in the game. I can say that because it's actually in the marketing material. So that's not a spoiler. So part of the, yeah, the the whole gimmick to the game is beating it several times and getting the different endings. Yeah. So it's not, it, it doesn't take uh, very long to get through. Yeah. I got my first ending within an hour and my second one 10 minutes later. <laughs> so, Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we are too late for Halloween, but you can play it over Christmas. So you can give yourself some Christmas holiday scares. That reminds me of like Nightmare Before Christmas. Because every year this comes around. I put this on my Twitter. Is Okay, so what is your take on this? You actually make movies. What What is the Nightmare Before Christmas? Is this a Christmas movie or a, a Halloween movie? So here's what I think. Nightmare Before Christmas is the last Halloween movie that I watch of the season. Because for me personally, once Halloween is over, I'm in Christmas mode. I I love Christmas. I also love Halloween. So The Nightmare Before Christmas for me is a perfect film to transition from Halloween to Christmas. Are so you, you say, wait, you're in Christmas mode on like November 1st? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't put up my tree or anything till the day after Thanksgiving, but I don't. When I say I'm in Christmas mode, I don't become irrationally angry by seeing Christmas decorations up like I do in October. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, okay, I, I always right, walk right, around right. and I'm like, Jesus, Santa's got to stick his fat ass into November or into October again. You know, I just so like, like if you, you like go to the hardware store and they've got all the Christmas blow up crap out. You're it doesn't like. What yes, the hell is this I went for this. Okay. I went to the hardware store this year on October 20th to buy Halloween decorations and they had all of them gone and all the Christmas shit was up. I was, <laughs> it was so stupid how upset I was by this. Like internally, I'm not like, you know, kicking over blow up Santa Clauses or anything like that. But I'm just like walking out to my store or out to my car. Just like, geez, what, what this is so stupid. My wife and kids are like, like dying for me to get like some enormous thing. So I don't, we may have like international listeners who have no idea what we're talking about. So in the uh, in the middle west of the United States, it is extremely popular to get uh, Christmas decorations that you put on your front lawn that are like ridiculously huge, like almost as large as your house itself. 
Yeah, and they have a fan that runs into them and they like inflate. So right. Like and giant you just, balloons. You almost. just keep them turned turned on for like two months straight. Like a, imagine a um a four meter tall yeah, a four meter tall Santa Claus on your front lawn for for two months with lights on it and it's making this giant like whizzing like whirring noise and uh, outside your front window for two months. <laughs> yeah. That's America. That's what we're doing over here. Fuck yeah. So. No, but my kids, my wife and kids like really want one of these things. Yep. So, but that's my take on uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is I feel like it should be the last. So Halloween it is a Halloween film. movie. Yeah. Well, it's both, but I, this it's is both. what I do is it's the last one that I watch of the Halloween season because it, it's a good send off for Halloween and it transfer transitions into Christmas perfectly. Okay. Okay, everybody, I think that's it. One last thing I wanted to say, our opening music. We did not have a credit for this in our, our first episode because when we recorded that, we didn't have any opening music. But our opening music is by Twee, that's T-U-I. They have made some really interesting, amazing stuff. In fact, they did the soundtrack to Witch and Wiz, also did the soundtrack to Flea and Tapeworm Disco Puzzle, Super Tilt Brothers, it just really excellent nes music also just some really good chiptune stuff so you can find them on twitter at tui 2 a 3 and they've also got a link to their soundcloud and they are taking commissions which awesome. is how we got them to do our opening music this has been the homebrew game club podcast you can find links to our discord back episodes of the show or other social media at homebrewgameclub.com and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at HB Game Club. If you like the show, please help us out by leaving a five-star review on iTunes. Please don't forget about our contest that we've got with Witch and Wiz. If you leave us a review, we will enter your name into a contest to win a digital copy of that game. If you have comments or a suggestion for a game that you would like to hear us talk about, shoot us a message on social media or email us at homebrewgameclub at gmail.com. We will get back to you fast you can follow me nick on twitter instagram or video game sage at dvertov that's d-v-e-r-t-o-v bart is on instagram at clever username needed no spaces and connor is on twitter at connor nash also no spaces tune in next time to the homebrew game club where we will be talking about dead AS for the game boy we will see you then thanks for listening Cool. Well, um, all right. Well, I guess we're done here then. That's fun. How do I stop this shit? Oh, I got to stop it on my end. Oh, you stop it on your end. Okay.